Dodson, you wear a number of hats, literally and metaphorically. You're known as the father of reconciliation, you're a former priest, you've won the Sydney Peace Prize, and now you're taking up an academic role. It seems like another first for you. Why are you taking this up? Well, I think it's timely in terms of uh, a need for a national dialogue uh, about our, uh, our underpinning philosophical basis as we re uh, uh, define, I suppose, our identity and role in a globalised society. So uh, I think it's an exciting thing, having, visit having visited many of the schools in uh, New South Wales, finding that there's 40 different language or cultural groups represented there. Uh, it makes the British foundations a bit archaic and we really need to define a, uh, an Australian identity that is inclusive. So academia, the research around that, the study, the uh, opportunities this all presents to us are, are really exciting things and at this stage in my life it's uh, something I'm very interested in. Can you tell me what the role will involve? I mean you've said it, it's about national identity but how will you go about doing that? Well it'll operate on two levels. It'll operate at a regional level so we'll engage with uh, people in regions uh, business people, Aboriginal people, uh, various sort of stakeholders, Aboriginal people themselves and have a uh, strategic dialogue about how they understand and see their uh, position as part of the nation and the nation building process and what it is that they see as uh, challenges to that process and how they, they might redefine some of those problems or challenges and then link that back into the national landscape and have a discussion at the national level uh, so that we become a bit more comfortable when we've got to deal with things like the Republic or a change to our constitution or how do we actually go about uh, domesticating the uh, uh, United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Peoples' Rights. How does that become law? What are the best ways to do that? To ensure that the full intent of that international declaration is available to the Indigenous Peoples without making that something that uh, uh, causes uh, unnecessarily concern uh, in, in, in the uh, British mould of our society. So for instance, taking for, uh, for example the intervention in the Northern Territory, how would a role like yours and this dialogue that you're establishing help prevent some of the problems that might be associated with that or perhaps with the Pilbara? How might? Well it, it's, it's an important uh, part of the equation that was missing by the intervention, uh, by nature, by definition, the intervention is a uh, usurping of people's rights and interests, and in this case a usurping of the Aboriginal people's rights and interests in a manner that uh, makes them far more dependent upon the public sector and on the agencies of, of the public service. And so that all the philosophies and practices in the past that were about self-determination, self-management, uh, people taking responsibility has basically been uh, pushed to one side and we've reinstituted the control over the lives of Aboriginal people by the public sector which I think is a pretty uh, damnable thing to have done and to then get down to the micromanagement of people's lives like their incomes I think is even more damnable um, on the basis that there have been uh, violence or uh, pedophilia or you know some kind of uh, abuse uh, within communities. Now if we're incapable of dealing with those issues in a normal manner with police and with agencies then really we're talking about a failed state and the intervention is, a, is an admission that the public sector policies are really about a failed state of government or governance in relation to Aboriginal affairs. So something like this role would prevent something like an intervention from happening ever again? Well, we'd seek, we'd seek to influence the policy decision uh, to um, ensure that Indigenous participation in the defining of, of how an intervention may take place, the nature of that intervention, the role and function of the Indigenous leadership, uh, that it's all integral in that process, rather than pushing it to one side and saying it, it doesn't exist and it's incapable of exercising the responsibilities that I know exist within Indigenous communities. There is a lot of academic work in Indigenous, um, in the Indigenous arena. This is quite a different role though, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's an Australian first, I believe. How do you see it as being different? Well, it's different in the sense that this is about an Australian dialogue. This is not Indigenous affairs. 
This is about the Australian people having a serious discussion, dialogue amongst themselves about what is it, what's the nature of our global identity. And we cannot just simply rest on the 1788 vision or the founding uh, settlers vision or the pioneers vision. We, we're now interlocked uh, in an international manner on many different fronts, which means that uh, we need to redefine our uh, identity as Australians, keeping what is good of that uh, British tradition. But if we're going to engage seriously with Asia uh, and, and uh, India and other nations, we really need to have a, an identity that is a bit more than the Anglo-Celtic mould through which we're perceived. I'm wondering how, how do you, what motivates you personally? I mean, you keep up a very busy schedule. What, what motivates you to kind of take up new roles constantly and, and keep going? Uh, well, I think this is a great country. We, we, Australia's a great country. It's capable of many great things. We do a lot of enormously valuable things internationally. But when it comes to the domestic situation, we become a bit schizophrenic when, deal, when we deal with Indigenous affairs. We think that this is only a uh, domestic matter. Uh, we, we've signed up, for instance, to the Millennium Development Goals. In 2000, we signed up to that to reduce world poverty by half by 2015. Now, you can't sign up to an international covenant or an international intent to do that and domestically say, well, this is too hard to do things with, with Indigenous peoples. Um, so my interest is, why is it so hard? Why are we so uh, schizophrenic uh, in our behaviour? Uh, internationally, we present a, a very different face than when we're dealing domestically with Indigenous affairs. Now, we've got to, we've got to overcome that, uh, that schism within our psyche and, and present a more united uh, approach as to whom we are. We're, we're very wonderful people, but we are schizophrenic when it comes to dealing with Indigenous peoples. You come from a family that seems to have been very politically motivated and very passionate. Where do you think that comes from, though? Oh, I think it comes from the early phases of injustice when you, when you had a native protector. Most people don't know what a native protector is, but a native protector who had total right and power and autonomy to determine uh, your life, uh, who you could marry, where you could live, uh, how you uh, conducted your uh, domestic affairs, uh, who could remove your children at any uh, point, uh, who could decide on uh, basically down to where the garbage bin had to be placed at the, at the uh, entrance to your house. Uh, so you come out of these sorts of moulds and you say, well, this is not how human beings are meant to be treated or what citizenship uh, entitles you to enjoy and uh, there are other standards and measures by which we should be uh, aspiring to and that those standards and measures ought to be implanted into the way we go about uh, life in this country and if we don't measure up to them then we should be challenged about it. So I suppose I, I uh, see the challenge of uh, trying to, to raise the bar upon the, uh, the sort of pedantry nature of our uh, behaviour domestically. And do you talk to your brother Mick about Indigenous issues a lot, or is you you know, or is it different from that? No, I uh, I periodically have some discussions with Mick, but he more or less does his own own things. Um, he's a lawyer, so he has a different way of sometimes looking at things. I'm I'm more philosophical, uh, and I have uh, have a broader based approach, I suppose, to uh, to the field of interest that I might have. Uh, but uh, we share a lot in common about justice and the enjoyment of human rights and the ability for, uh, for equality uh, in the nation, not only for Indigenous people but for, for all Australian people. And as I say, we have a diversity now that we seriously have to capitalise upon and enable to enrich our identity as Australians. It's a grand opportunity. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an impediment. Mm. Uh, the fact that we have 40 different language groups from different cultures <coughs> making up our society in our schooling systems in many places it's got to be an asset for us and we've got to be able to capitalize on that mm. <coughs> just one last question how do you reflect on your time as a catholic priest that was a, a long time ago now but how do you reflect on that oh well i thought it was a it was a very rewarding time <coughs> it was a time when um, Obviously the operations of, of the work that you did as a Catholic priest was very confined uh, and, and you tended to be uh, 
uh, involved in a, in, a, in a sort of narrow aspect of our society whilst talking about more universal kinds of issues um, and to be involved in the broader domains of the society was deemed to be political. I always thought that was a false dichotomy, a, a false uh, uh, way of perceiving the role. Um, and um, uh, uh, But generally I had a very rewarding period. Uh, I did a number of interesting things like uh, Travel Australia, looking at the alcohol problems that were affecting Aboriginal peoples, uh, which took me six months or so, uh, right around Australia. Uh, I got involved in uh, land rights campaigns, which obviously got me into strife with some bishops. Um, but generally, uh, uh, I was exposed to the international dimension, uh, particularly going to the Dominican Republic and seeing how uh, a different model of church could operate where the lay people had a far greater role uh, rather than the sort of uh, clerical domination model that uh, exists here in Australia. So uh, there are some interesting things about it that uh, for me uh, we were being a bit uh, restricted upon in, uh, in what we could or couldn't do in, in, in the church structure, but generally good experience. Pat Dodson, a pleasure to meet you and congratulations on the professorship. Thank you very much, very pleased to be here.